you could just forget about it. So we were putting a more in the And my husband is in the water. And we're in the car. They haven't been sailing yet. And he was sailing. I'm sailing. You're on the other side. 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 You're uh, I thought I was going to be able to. Well, then I thought that was racing. We race, but we don't race. We don't kill each other. Yeah, but this is a little bit of a job. Yeah, that's so weird. Oh, oh my God. You know, it's the Saturday on the race street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. where is it? Uh, yeah. At our house. Oh, it is? <laughs> yeah. Maybe <laughs> at yes. uh, 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 I'd love, love to come. come. Oh, yeah, we'd love to have you there. Well, how old is it? It's all different folks. Yeah, it's not on class. Everybody's got a handicap. Yeah, I have a whole bunch of I have a whole bunch of chats. 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 Well, this one, I, don't know. I just got on a boat. No, yes, it was like a Wednesday afternoon or right, right. No, it was like a Saturday. Yeah. Uh, Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a fun race. That's a good race. Yeah. And, and we, and we, I started in the spring. And I got and there. Well, was, well, was, well, was like, yeah. and I he said, I'm going to double the He said, that water. Yes, I bought this. That's a good thing. I'll put it in the gas. No, it wasn't in the gas. It'll make more. Yeah, I tried to say, I'm going to waste out a few ways. I would do, I've done. Someone he can race it. Oh, my sitting on the you're sitting on the rail at 2 a.m. You know, like sure. This is so yeah. It's supposed to be fun, but they're very serious. Um very serious. You know, who, who are you with? I'm not sure which one. Hold on. He can see that. He's in the house. I think he reached out to Greg and Wayne. I think she's still there. They had some young people that were there. They 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 were there. I have a friend here from the Black terms, and they are really retired, Charlie's Yeah. Are you really retired? You should go see No, it's a term. Well, I know. It's not a it's a black yeah. turn and it's a yeah. most times in the ocean. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. 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 You receive, yeah, well, well, there's a lot of wires from the other time. Yeah, when you go on the bridge, what brings you to the Well, we're still there on the grove, like water quality. Well, here we're yeah. I hope that a couple of you will come to our meetings. Yeah, that would be fine. In collaboration and okay. well coordinated. Sure. Hey, Julie. So, Saturday, the uh, Yacht Club every Saturday? Uh, no, I'm about the Yacht Club. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's oh, the cross. Yeah. 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 You know, we can't renew it. Yeah. So that's a point for us. When we get to renew it, we take a left. We can't grow. Okay. We're the last house of the left. So it's Andre. Andre. Yes. Thank you. I'm still going to be the last one. I'm going to be the last one. I'm going to be the last one. I'm trying to keep that. Yeah. That's good enough. you all have a nice yeah. memorial day? Well, last year was that was your bullshit. Yeah. You went to my work, but you know, didn't do it. Oh, I did that. That's all I'm doing is work. Opening day. Where you want? Where you live? And that was so great. Okay. Hey, Lynn, can you hear us? Oh. Yep, I can hear you. Oh, can you on um, you on on video me? so we can see you? No, no. Uh, oh. Sure, one second. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Hey, welcome aboard here. I think we'll start with just we've got some great some new people here. It's a, well, it's a guest. We really appreciate being here, both of you. So if you could kind of start, Charlie. Uh, Charlie Bader, formerly with Seven Lakes Alliance, and um, one of your pitches. Thank you very much. Lynn Matson here on behalf of the Road Water Quality and Natural Resources Committee. And uh, I'll, I'll make a comment in a minute, but this is Michelle Stafford, who's also from the Rome Committee. Okay. Thank you. Stafford, S-T-A. S-T-A-F-F-O-R-D. Okay, thanks. Okay. I'm Lenny Reich. I'm on the Lakes and Natural Resources Committee. I'm Tanya Raffinus. I'm on the Lake Committee, um, brought on to represent uh, Friends of Mass Lawrence. Oh, Paul Feinberg. I'm just there. <laughs> Kimberly Dallas, also on the committee. Uh, Chris Bradley on the committee uh, from Great Pond, and uh, Pat nominated me to, to uh, run this show. So, uh, <laughs> willingly, of course. Not your first word, yeah. <laughs> Some say I have a good eye for talent. Yeah, he's good. <laughs> Pat Gaudio, Chair. Uh, Berlinget, PLA President. I'm Brandon Curtin Sanger, Curtin Camp of New York and Great Pond, and a seasonal resident. And I'm here out of interest and um, wanting to learn more as to what the hell happened last year, especially with the, the impact on the lake. Initial life. Yeah. My name is Peter Carter, and I'm on the Clinton Board. Now we did last meeting. And that one came over and see what's kind of going on here. Uh, and uh, so I like to come with some of these meetings as a, as a guest and uh, and what Randy up to speed a little bit and then just told her about things. And I've talked to my neighbors on the Great Pond as well. And, uh, they'll be showing up sometime in the near future. So we appreciate we appreciate all of our guests. And, and would you be talking. putting your name again? I didn't catch your name. Randy Sanger from the Curtain Camp on Great Pond North End. S A N G E R. S A N G E R. Formerly Randy Curtain, right? 
What? Formerly Randy, yeah. originally Randy Curtin. Yeah. I, I don't think I've seen you since I was a kid uh, <laughs> playing at the tennis court. Chris, Chris Bradley, uh, cousin of uh, Chip and Webb and right. everybody else. You were just a little fat. I was a little fat. Yeah. You were a bigger yeah, we were yeah. Double you, oh, yeah, you guys were <laughs> fat. Our, our, our first uh, item is old business consideration of the May 7th minutes. Uh, Kimberly was kind enough to do them and sent it out. I don't know if everybody has had a chance to review it yet. I did. I, I'd like, uh, I, I saw a couple um, just uh, spelling autocorrect uh, yeah. uh, prosperous instead of phosphorus. So, oh. uh, <laughs> so there are two. Well, um, same. But I think, you know, other than that, I uh, found it fine and would move as amended to uh, accept it. Do I hear uh, any discussion? I'll second it. No, oh, sorry. Well, I, I haven't read it, so I'm going to just abstain. I didn't, okay. Somehow I didn't get it. It just came out today. Just came out. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. You didn't see it either. I didn't see it either. Maybe we should table for next week so we can read the minutes. Sure. Yeah, we can table. Next week. Yeah. So we need a motion to table the minutes. Motion to table. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. I'll make the changes and get those back. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Our first order of new business is discussion of road issues and potential changes to the shoreline zone ordinance. That would help reduce phosphorus from coming into our roads. And we've got two great presenters today, Charlie Beta and Geiger. Then you want to. Yeah, uh, Charlie, want to lead us in the right direction? I'll start in discussion. Um, thank you for having me. Um, roads are a big issue um, with us, at set, and I say us, formerly Seven Lakes. Um, Excuse me, we are recording? Yeah. We do a lot of work at Seven Lakes um, having to do with roads and fixing roads. Um, we do that in conjunction with Maine DEP. We have been writing management plans, doing surveys, and getting grants for, you know, actually pre preceding me. Um, and act the, the original grants that um, Seven Lakes got were back in literally the year 2000, um, doing uh, initial surveys of the watershed. Uh, that slowed down um, to the point of having one grant uh, back in 2012. We now have four grants, I believe, um, on lakes in the watershed, um, and we just applied for three more for this coming year. Um, so Seven Lakes is committed to um, fixing roads in the watershed. When I say grants, we get grants from Maine DEP, um, and it's uh, US EPA money. And it specifically is targeting fixing watershed erosion. And um, anyway, long story short is roads are right at the top of the list for watershed erosion. Um, we know about camps along the shore. We know about development. That's also can be an issue. Uh, but roads uh, and the, um, the, the amount of phosphorus loading from roads, um, which we call the external source, in the watershed uh, is, is a big factor. And thankfully, um, our lakes have been identified by Maine DEP as being a priority. Um, unfortunately, um, they're either impaired or threatened. And roads, when we do the modeling for the roads uh, in the management plans, roads are basically at the top of the list for things that we can do in the watershed to reduce erosion and phosphorus into the lakes. Um, the other major category, uh, potentially things we can do have to do with septic. Uh, so I'll mention that today as well, um, because I know we're looking at having big road here in the future, but roads are a big factor. We've got to take care of them. Um, that's state roads, town roads, and private roads. It also includes driveways in our experience at Seven Lakes. Um, and uh, the driveways I like to describe as the last 50 feet to the lake. Um, and often they're like this, and often they're not in great shape. Many are in good shape these days, which is great, uh, but many are not. And um, it's kind of a low hanging fruit if we can fix those, as well as the gravel roads. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about road ordinances. I couldn't find many in the state of Maine. 
Um, I sent around some notes. Um, we were gathering information, Lynn and I, as recently at one o'clock today. We, we talked to somebody who's the deputy, deputy director in the planning department in the city of Auburn today, um, who I'd like to actually have come to these meetings um, in a month. He's not available in the early June, but could be available a month from now, later in June. Um, he has a lot of experience in this watershed. He used to work for the Kennebec Valley Soil and Water District. His name is John Blaze. I sent around a document, which was basically his document, where they're presenting to the city council in Auburn ways to reduce erosion into Lake Auburn, which is a drinking water source for the city of Auburn. Um, and they have similar concerns about, again, reducing erosion and phosphorus into the lake. Lake Auburn is one of 50 lakes in the country or drinking water sources in the U.S. that is not filtered. And it's because of fairly good water quality that it doesn't require filtration at a certain level by U.S. EPA. So they have a big investment in keeping the lake clean in order to be able to draw drinking water out of it. Now they do filter it, but they don't have to go through advanced filtration systems that cities do often uh, because of all contaminated water. Um, so anyway, they, they do a lot in Lake Auburn to try to mitigate erosion and runoff. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Charlie, what's his last name? John Blaise, B-L-A-I-S. A-I-S. B-L-A-I-S. And he's the deputy director for a department in the city of Auburn. Um, deputy director of what? You know? um, it, it's planning and development, and, but I don't know the exact title, and I can get you that. So we can edit that part of the minutes. <laughs> um, but he's he's worked in this watershed. He did some of the original work with Pete Callen 15 years ago on the Long Pond um, projects. And um, and I met him back then. So I I found out he was re working for the city of Auburn. I, Lynn and I gave him a call today and um, he spent some time, sent a bunch of materials. He said, please edit them so that there aren't names attached to some of these documents. We're gonna do that later this week and then we'll send it around to the group. Uh, I also sent around a couple of documents from the uh, town of Wyndham because Wyndham has fairly good ordinances having to do with stormwater management. Um, and um, I haven't spoken to anybody at Wyndham yet, but uh, I think I will just to find out um, the, the, some of the lessons learned. I do want to talk about that with the ordinances, not so much the details of what you ought to do, but you know, how do these go into effect? Do they only factor in new construction or does it take care of existing construction? Um, if it does take care of existing construction, how do you, John McLean, we talked to some people at DEP last week as well. John McLean runs certain parts of their road programs. Um, and um, he said that what they look for is triggers. Uh, basically, how do you have an opportunity to intervene uh, to require a higher standard, uh, whether it's in a buffer or some kind of erosion control feature. Um, and you do that when somebody applies to do additional development on their property. So what is that trigger? In the city of Auburn, it's 200 square feet. So at 200 square feet, you have to have an erosion control plan. Um, between two and 600, it can be by a third party like Seven Lakes Alliance. Uh, above 600, it has to be by a professional engineer. So there's there are certain standards that they have for having erosion control be implemented. Uh, it doesn't take care of the existing development, uh, unfortunately, because most roads are already built. But at least for new development, um, it does. I did see in city, uh, town of Wyndham that they had a trigger for also when properties change hands. Uh, similar to what they have for septics. Um, but city of Auburn's not going that far yet. You know, they're taking an incremental approach to try and implement improvements in their ordinances. Um, and um, so for them, 
it's when you do additional development above 200 square feet, you've got to start mitigating the runoff from your site. Um, and then they have various buffer standards. For example, um, if you did a new development within the watershed, this is within the watershed, not even within the shoreland zone, just within the watershed of Lake Auburn, you do a new development now, um, you have to have a buffer. And if it's, um, and, and so, you know, you're building a house, putting in a road, you have to put in a buffer. And the buffer standard is 25 feet in certain areas, 50 feet in others, and, and up to 75 feet in others. So in, in one way or another, they're taking care of new development, which is great. Yeah. But if you're, excuse me, if you're back in the watershed yep. and not in the shoreland zone, what is it a buffer from? Runoff. You, they want to keep runoff from getting into the ditch that ends up. So, but it's, so then it's the buffer from the ditch. You, yeah, you would buffer from the area that you've developed to uh, natural areas or wherever the drainage is going to the lake. Okay, very good. Thank you. That's that's what I was well, Charlie, I believe Wyndham has a surface water ordinance that it takes all the land outside of the shoreline zone that have the shoreline zoning, but they also have this other layer. Within the, the, that water, the bigger watershed, and they they yes. target Highland Lake is yes. is one of their lakes that they're trying to yes. keep from degrading, um, and also they they border Lake Sebago on the other end of the town. Uh, but yes, so they have so these towns are looking at this. So there are some examples, um, and as we can gather more information, they apply not only to roads but also to development and septic. Your other two areas that where you can make an impact. Mm -hmm. Charlie, is there any uh, regulations that you know that are retroactive? They're all, in other words, you can't. Well, that's where the property, you know, changing hands. For example, with septic systems, you're now required to get a septic inspection. Um, I believe if you're in the shoreland zone, correct me if I'm wrong, Lynn, or if you know the details, but. When a property changes hands, shoreland zone, you have to get a septic inspection. Um, and that way the, the buyer knows the information going into it and presumably negotiates that. Um, and it has and the some idea, I, I believe I saw in the Wyndham regs that they were looking at that also for erosion control. So um, if you bought a place but I think they were looking at it actually because of the turnover of houses actually being implemented across the watershed in a 30 to 50 year time frame. So it's not something that was immediately because of properties changing hands at a certain rate. Mm -hmm. uh, they expected to actually implement these things um, over a long period of time. In terms of retro. Oh, there's something very similar. Lake Tahoe, California, they've got standards that some kick in in 2030, some kick in in 2040, some kick in it. So they're raising the bar. They, they knew that trying to do it all at once was going to have a lot of political and, and community pushback. So they uh, took an incremental approach to implementing a higher set of standards every decade or so um, going forward. So I think there's different approaches. Um, and, and, and getting some direction from the select board might be helpful, um, at a certain point, because again, you might say, this is our goal. This is what we want to accomplish this year. Um, and, and having that vision, I think is good. Um, but I also think taking, um, the, maybe, a um, ladder approach, you, you kind of go up one tier at a time might be, um, uh, politically uh, doable. When, what, what, what was your comment on you? Hmm. I was going to say, in terms of retroactive sort of ordinances, um, the easiest thing to do would be to implement the septic um, inspections and requiring those uh, to be filed with the town. Um, since inspections are... Um, I think that was in the Auburn uh, documents, right, Charlie, that they were starting to require septic ex inspections every five years. Um, yes. so that, yeah, so that's something that you could do um, kind of retroactively or 
rather as a way to affect all properties instead of just new ones. Then the other thing that would be relatively easy to implement would be um, a tax on runoff. So that would be if basically you'd have to pay a little bit more property tax for whatever percentage of your property is impervious surface. And then you could have a tax break if you have a uh, low impact development, um, best management practices or a buffer be between your developed land and the runoff ditch or drainage ditch. Um, the town of Wyndham document for the stormwater management has a point system where you get points for things like rain gardens. So if you're catching that water before it leaves your property, getting it into the ground, you get, I think it was 40 points. And, and you get, as you, as you build points by having these features on your property, um, you, you may be able to get, you can also use it as an incentive to be able to develop it. If you have a really well buffered property um, with, with great BMPs to get water into the ground rather than into the lake, you can maybe get an extra point, you know, extra development option on your property, um, you know, things like that. So they're 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 looking at incentives uh, in both directions, both to limit bad development and to encourage good development on the other side. Yep, and this is something that you could do across the whole watershed, and basically say, don't let your runoff run off of your property, like. It shouldn't be your neighbor's issue to deal with your runoff. So that could be an easy way to sell it to the general population um, as a, you have to be responsible for what's coming off of your property. And the city of Arbor and person John Blaze today was saying they're spending a lot of time and effort on education and outreach. So before they try to implement this new standard for SEPTA, they're going to be talking to people in the community because they know there's going to be pushback. So, 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 so they have a in existence. They passed an ordinance on. They have an existing ordinance. They're upgrading ordinances and making certain changes. Okay. Um, right now, it's right in front of the planning board down there and the city council. Um, and they're also consulting with other towns like Wells and Agunquit on on the the changes that they've already made the last couple of years. John's been there about three years. He had, again worked in. The, a couple of other posts, but you know, erosion and and the bell braids are are things that he cares about, which is why he'd be willing to come here and talk with us if, if you think that makes yeah. sense. But once we Lynn and I review the materials he sent us, um, we'll uh, get it to the committee, and then if, if we want to extend an invitation, um, we could do that. You know, in a week or so. So, so we have the the draft ordinance for Kinzer Lake. That was uh, yeah. the day Rope had circulated. Um, so the um, septic ins inspection ordinance for Auburn is in draft form at this point. It's not. Uh, it's not. It, it's still. It, it, they had apparently the the management of the of the city changed over the last election or so. So they got approval from one. City Council, and now they're going through so the they're, they're tweaking it to get you know current approval. Um, okay. and it's it's likely to be implemented, you know, anytime in, in August. And actually, Dave wrote consulted on their uh, changes as well. So it'd be great to get a copy of that, uh, you know, because yes. um, the the um, late, you know, Keyser Lake ordinance is is interesting, but it hasn't been. Implemented and and um, Dave Rope's message was that uh, they had other things going on in Keyser Lake, so they were putting it off until probably next year or so. Well, one like, of the things in Auburn is 400 feet from the lake for a new septic system. You're putting a new septic wow. system 400 feet, and now for people who are already living closer to the lake and they need to you know change their septic system because it's failing, um, they're obviously going to make exceptions. So there's going to be language about how do you make an exception? Do you have to upgrade the system? Uh, do you, so there's um, they have a, a bunch of BMPs that are kind of designed to do that, um, and we don't need to get into those. But um, 
So there's ways to increase the standards whenever somebody needs to do something like change the septic system, like put on 200 square feet of new development around your property, including a new parking area, including a new driveway. Um, you know, all, the, the question then becomes implementation. They've got a planning department. They've got a, you know, so at a town level like us, um, do we have capacity to, to implement some of that and, and how much of it? And does that require additional resources and how do you pay for it, I guess, at the end of the day? So, and, but if it's a goal, it's doable. The question is, you know, how the logistics. So, well, yeah. I had a quick question. Are they going to watershed down there? Yep. They have, they, they have a watershed organization? Yes. Yeah. And Lake, Ford, or Lake Auburn has also got a watershed district because of the, or, you know, there, there's a governmental body because of the drinking water aspects of it. So, and there's also a, um, in, in Wyndham has a Highland Lake leadership team or something like that, which is um, Wyndham, Falmouth, um, or Freeport, one of the two towns there, I think it's Falmouth, um, and DEP and, and a couple of other, you know, players um, who, you know, are looking at management and ordinances and things like that. So I think, I think Wyndham will be helpful. Um, and, and I think the city of Auburn, you know, they, the fact that they're also paying attention to the septic is, uh, is I know right what you're looking at too. Right. So, so uh, focusing on the shoreland uh, zone, which is really our mandate to look at, um, what um, can you articulate a, a um, you know, ordinance or I guess the low hanging fruit is always just going to be new development. You know, as, as John McLean at DEP said, you look for your triggers. Where, when can you force the issue? So you can force the issue when somebody wants to do something, whether, you know, anything that's already regulated, uh, and then provide buffer to, you know, make sure that any of that new development does not um, impact the resource, you know, whether it's the stream or the lake or the wetland. Um, I use it as a trigger to retrofit the, the property, right? You want to do, you want a new development, you want a new septic system where you've got to fix these issues too. Um, it, that would be the next tier. You know, the, 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 the minimal approach is doing nothing. The, the, the next tier is doing it only in relation to the new development. So you put in a new driveway that has to be properly ditched or culverted or, or whatever good materials, some kind of an inspection schedule so it's maintained. Um, but again, that's a capacity of the town, you know, right. you want to pay your CEO to double check on all these things or pay us or ask seven leaks to do it or whoever's going to do it. Um, um, but that needs to be thought about um, is how do you, you know, what's the take in personnel costs and what's the take in dollars to make that happen? Um, but, um, but the next tier up is you want to do something with the property. Um, you really have to fix these other problems that, you know, were not part of our, you know, vision, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and then finally, uh, do you want to go after people, you know, where you don't have that trigger, you know, when, or, you know, when the property changes hands or, um, in 50 years, everybody has to fix everything. Um, you know, so I think there's, different levels that you can take this. I guess the concern is that, that um, you know, it seems like the approach to take would be to, to uh, rank the priority of, of... Well, they did that on the set that we brought that up with John Blaze today. And we said, you know, city, of the town of Smithfield, 25% of their septic records are, or you can't find them, right. uh, either at the state level or at the town. So, and they're in the shoreland zone. And they're on bad soils. So that would be, you know, maybe the first tier of enforcement. Those people have to get them inspected. Um, the right. second tier might be all systems over, you know, since prior to 1995 uh, when they upgraded the standards. Um, and then the last tier might be sort of the maintenance on the systems that were at least designed well, the ones after 1995. 
So those could be yeah, that's that's worry about much, that. That's in, pretty much articulated in the brink uh, or yes, uh, same or idea. teaser lake. But yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of going back to the uh, erosion. If you look at places that like at, uh, Randy's, uh, the road down to the curtain camp goes down past uh, Lakeshore Farm on, on uh, um, Starboard Lane, uh, coming down from Mount okay. Yeah. And uh, it goes, it runs down to the Taconic parking lot yep. there. Um, that's been classically uh, an erosion issue, yep. uh, which I think might have been a non point source uh, um, erosion issue or was in the survey of Great Pond. It's on our list for this year. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's something that um, can we uh, get an ordinance where, even though let's assume that my sister's not doing anything at farm <laughs> to cause a trigger uh, to con it's not adding any capacity for parking. Is there a way for us to have an ordinance to um, force that to be dealt with uh, with test management practices? Well, I think you can, but I think that's where it becomes, you know, it's always going to be political, but that's where that's how do you pay for it? Do you force them to do it? Is the right. town going to do it? And, you know, those kinds of things. There's there's a law on the main books that allows towns to pay for private road improvements, which we found. Um, few towns do it, take advantage of it. Wyndham apparently does. They have like you know, they have different grant and loan programs depending on capacity of the people to pay. Um, and how they raise fees for it, I don't know yet because I haven't taken it that far. But they're trying to. Uh, address these issues in creative ways, let's say. So, um, and we find, you know, with these 319 grants that we get by providing some financial incentive, we get things done. And there's usually somebody that wants to spend those dollars to mm -hmm. fix a road problem. They know it's a road problem, and then essentially they get it at half price. So, it's um, it provides a good financial incentive. Do the towns want to take it that far? Um, I wouldn't want to recommend that as a starting point, mm -hmm. but um, you know, um, or do you use you know you use carrot or stick or a little bit of both is kind of what we're looking at, and you can use the the you know the the stick so to speak when you when people want something and when they want to make an upgrade. But in your question, how do you provide an incentive to do it? One is financial, and one would be that you you fix your dirt problems. We we do surveys all the time in all the lakes. Um and and you see the problems as you drive by as you know we document these um and it is causing a, a damage to a public resource the lake. Um there's you know the, the town has grounds to create an ordinance that says you have to fix these things. Period. End of story. DEP has a law that says the same thing. DEP has never enforced it. I talked to somebody last week about that. They've never enforced that issue. It, it'd have to be egregious as heck to um, have DEP enforce it. Um, and does the town want to take on that kind of enforcement? So DEP has a uh, has there's a an law. existing law in the books that you can't you know, put dirt in a way. Period. End of story. Yeah. <laughs> and they. You know, it's happening on such a large scale. You know, the person I spoke with who's pretty knowledgeable, it, you know, said we could have 50 people working on this. Um, you know, we really were trying to do it. Um, but it's so it's problematic. So, Charlie, are you suggesting because I know that we've done the survey work is determined some sites that are high impact erosion sites. Yes. Lots that, of them. that somehow that determination be a key or medium a trigger but, yeah. for the town to say okay if the if some standard if it's a high yes. impact site the town then has some enforcement what, if the, what the town can create an ordinance to yes th that can provide enforcement yes but so that, right now it doesn't exist yeah i'd be very cautious about that for the following reason the um every 10 years as charlie knows very well uh, as does uh, everybody else here who's a member of a lake association. Every 10 years, the lake associations uh, do, sh uh, uh, do, do watershed surveys 
And uh, in, in doing that, we, uh, we approached the, the, the shoreland property owners, often uh, beforehand through, uh, through mail communications or email communications. And we say, uh, we, you know, we're, we'd like to do, we're doing a survey on such and such a date. Uh, we would like to be able to come up with all, on your property to, to, you know, look at the shore and so forth and explain what it's all about. And we assure them that as part of the process, you know, we're looking for, you know, erosion problems and so forth, but we, all, we, we, we tell them we're doing that and we assure them that there is no enforcement mechanism involved in what we are doing. That's a very big part of what we have to say or we do say in order to get permission to go in uh, on their property. And, and in fact, if the town were to use uh, the, the surveys as uh, is being suggested here, uh, that would make it much more difficult for the lake associations or anybody to go in and have access to have access to go and do the surveys because people would know that, aha, if they come in here and find something that's a problem, then the town can require me to fix it. And I don't want them to. So just so why should it be any different? I mean, this can change. Why should it be any different than the code enforcement's authority to go in if there's a sanitary issue or a building issue? This is a, the same kind of an issue that, that there should be enforcement. That... But there is no issue. In those cases, it's the code enforcement officer is going in because there is an issue or there's reason to believe there's an issue as opposed to just going all around and looking at everybody's property. I think you could, you could, in the next surveys, you could change it and say it's subject to enforcement, but we've got to get to the point of enforcement. And you can say that, but then you would be you would be locked out of. I suspect you would be prevented from going to any property. But I think that I I wouldn't worry about that problem. At least, well, I've I've done two surveys now, and I would worry about that problem. Well, maybe it may reduce the amount of access to property, but so what? I mean, we're still going to be able to get access to property and determine some high impact areas. I mean, are you suggesting we don't do anything? No, well, I'm suggesting that the approach that you're discussing, which is that the town use surveys that have been done by the lake associations, at least that's the what I'm hearing, or at least what I'm assuming, maybe that maybe my assumption is incorrect, that using those surveys for the purpose of enforcement is not a good idea, or is something that should be thought through very really carefully. I, I think you I think you're right. right to be thoughtful about it and careful. Yeah, it, it, the, these surveys do rely on goodwill, mm -hmm. and yeah, you know, and there, we already have an opt out. And when we send them the letters, you know, you can opt out of the survey, and, and one out of whatever twenty opt out um, already. It, that would increase. If we get to that, um, yeah, many what points. If, what if you had a requirement that if you've got a road or a driveway in the shoreland zone, it needs to be registered, just like a permanent dock or a boathouse or whatever? You know, that, that all had to happen back in the 60s. Um, so, so you have to register your driveway. And and then there's a mechanism to look at that and judge whether it's uh, you know running phosphorus into the water. You can do that, yes. I, and then you know I'm assuming that I know for new construction again again existing to build something and yeah. But that's, new construction, you're supposed to get in touch with your road commissioner and see about putting another entrance on the road, for example. But it would seem that, you know, with your, I know with Auburn, you, in order to get your uh, certificate of, uh, of occupancy, you, your, your driveway has to be up to standard. And the driveway calculations are taken into uh, account when you're looking at the impervious surface uh, and things like that. So, again, new construction, they have a, a fairly comprehensive approach. Uh, old construction and how you get at those, I, I'm less sure. No, I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah. What if, um, what if the town required you to register uh, all roads and driveways in the shoreline zone? 
and then start there. Those yeah. were start there, yeah. and then those need to be inspected. Because I think what what we're trying to get at is, yeah, the survey. I can I can see the the survey. We don't want to screw that up. You know, that's a good thing uh, because then you can go to people, which I I know, seeing it happen to people I know, and say that this is a um, there's a non-point source. Pollution, yeah, erosion on your yeah. on your property, yeah. and so therefore we'd like you to fix it. And most people I know are like, "Yeah, sure, I'll fix it." I didn't know I had a problem, you yeah. know. It, uh, and it's a goodwill thing, but I, I think what we're trying to do is get at the um, the low hanging fruit that are that is you know pumping a lot of uh, uh, runoff into the lake, um, and and that would be. You know, we just got to come up with another mechanism. And I, I think we probably, you probably could come up with a list. You know, Seven Lakes could probably come up with a list of known offenders, you know, that may or may not come from a survey and might probably wouldn't be. The, uh, well, we're always, you know, the, the surveys are great and they identify, yeah. let's say, more than half the problems. But then, you know, as we get to know the properties and as, uh, you know, last year's storms, you know, found all the weaknesses in the system. Um, right. You know, so there's new problems that have surfaced in the last year. Um, so the, that that information always has to be updated. Right. And the new construction it does add more. But the um, you know the, these bigger storms are are you know adding more issues that we have to deal with. But I think we need some standard in the ordinance for the town to say that. A property owner is in violation. Otherwise, like I give you an example, I this morning I was met with Lynn for an erosion problem on a on a road that I'm the road commissioner for, but property owner is not going to do anything. And so I have to know a brook with Charlie on this road before with 319 grant, and we provide the road association that I'm a commissioner of. Agreed to only have half of it. But if we didn't do that, it would just continue on. And there's no way to go to the town and say, property owner, it's against the law, and you're allow this. I impact the erosion site to continue. So I think we have to have an ordinance that's on the books that says the property owner can't allow, and that we come up with a standard. And so are there examples? So that we could copy from uh, Auburn or Wyndham or, or somebody else that has uh, ordinance that uh, can get to that. Because we, uh, I think, I feel more confident that new construction is not the problem. Uh, I feel more confident that the old situations that have been going on, you know, my, fam my family's camp is 92 years old and and it's never going to change hands. So never going to catch us. <laughs> right. You know? So uh, we want uh, we want those uh, those things brought to life in, in some fashion. Okay. I yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Charlie and Lynn, I live on Foster Lane, but I'm not on Voice Island, and we had a, we had a really rough camp. It was you know, built you know for the old Great Lakes Hotel the development. And so it was, you know, probably 10 residences on it. So four culverts, ditching. It's like the typical thing everybody knows is a problem, but how are we going to fix it? Who's going to pay for it? So Charlie and Lynn came over and did a survey. It's about a quarter of a mile long. They identified what size culvert they should be, where should the grading be, really take, take it off. They got responsibility for all the civil engineering, the organization repairs working with a contractor and they get half the money from the road and the other half from the 319. Uh, I was think, I was thinking of a role for the lake associations in that rather than they're they're helping out the, the, the people who road to very few, very little when they gotta all pull together with themselves and then how wealthy they are, how much they care. Get, when you get somebody who brings you the plan, you can chip in and do it. And that also gives you access to their property all through it. Because mm -hmm. they you want to walk, you know, they walk right down the road, look at the driveways, look at everything. And you get to talk to people, hey, you need a buffer here too. 
So I, I kind of see that as a, a role we could use as Lakeshore Association. Mm -hmm. You want our target areas, so not all are bad, but there's a lot of them, and try to work with that to get things running. So are you saying that um, that's a role for the, like the BLA? Yeah. Uh, which, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But what can we do? Um, is, that, is that good enough, I guess? Is that is just to leave it up to and, and create another initiative for BLA and the other latest associations? Um, is that good enough or, or is there an opportunity to put something in an ordinance that uh, will have some teeth behind for this is the question. What, what do you Either think? Either one. It, it, both, I mean, I would sort of think of both. I think you could have both. You could have, you know, they could be on a smaller level and, you know, but just something to get, get some, get the ball rolling. It would be great to have the Lake Association and Southern LA involved. Yeah, and they, and they got the expertise, the Lake Association, some of them have plenty of money to chip in. It's their donors who want the lake water quality, have a big interest in it. And it'll also, I think, up to the septic and yep. stuff. Absolutely. And uh, mm -hmm. just some way to get things started. Yeah. Because I know on our road, if nothing was happening. The little Charlie could say, well, This is what you can do. Here's your cost. Here's how it's going to fix it. I go, Yeah. How much? And there was. I think the plan is important yeah. to your, you know, but we also provide the financial incentive, yeah. which makes it even easier. But having a plan to organize around, um, and sometimes the outside expert, even though the people on the road probably know it better than we ever will, having somebody come in from the outside that has some credibility is useful to get to move the ball. So, in, but in addition, if we can bring money into it, money. it all the better. Um, and that's what I was talking about, carrots and sticks. That's a good carrot. Um, and having an organized effort with the Lake Association, Seven Lakes and the Towns, to pay attention to this, we're all on the same page, I think is an important communications message. Um, but to your point of how do you, you know, not everybody's going to get on board, and does it matter in the long, you know, is that a 5% that you can not worry about, or is it 30 or 40% that you really got to push a little bit harder. And what percentage of the phosphorus going in the lake is from people who are not going to change and right. need, and, need and, and they're affecting this? I don't think you know, we know that yet. No. Yeah. Because, you know, when you do the survey, you're not gauging the, you know, willingness of the people to, to change. But in general, you get, when we send letters out, follow up letters, most people are positive. But not everybody. You know, does what we want, <laughs> and um, right. you know, because we make suggestions for planning buffers all the time, mm -hmm. and people often don't do it. Um, so some do, some don't, and then we work, you know, incrementally with those that do. Um, so it's, you know, and in the long run, the hundred-year plan. Um, you know, do we need to have? I think it's a bit of both. I think you need to have strong ordinances that protect water quality so that it's built right. And and I think a good hook is when people want to do something on their land, develop it further, um, kind of retrofitting your BMPs to make sure they work. That's a great opportunity. You, know, you have leverage, okay. you know. Um, okay. And um, that, so I think finding ordinances around that is, a, is, is worthwhile. Um, and then, and, and, but really paying attention to the communication issue at every level, the town level, um, the Lake Association, the, you know, sort of the nonprofit level. Uh, I think it, it, we've got to work together. Um, and the fact that, you know, Belgrade's addressing this, I think is really encouraging. I'd like to see us make some, you know, success here as far as, you know, creating a couple of ordinances that, um, move the ball forward and then talking to other towns in the watershed, uh, you know, this is doable. And the, these are things that we're, you know, trying to achieve here. Um, let's see if Rome can do that on Great Pond. Mount Vernon can do that on Long Pond, you know, things like that. I think um, I'm encouraged, you know, that you're, you're having the conversation. It's, it's where it's going to start. So, right. Yes, sir. We've talked about these surveys that have been done in all the lakes over the last several years now. So we've got over a thousand sites that I know have been identified as erosion problems on the seven lakes in this, this greater um, Bud Lake watershed. 
And Lynn and Lynn Geiger and her team go out there on a regular basis to try to deal with some of these problems using the surveys to identify the, the problem areas. I'm just wondering, Lynn, what, what kind of resistance are you running into when you try to work in some of these areas? And what do you need in the way of ordinances to help you actually implement and improve some of these sites? Lynn, did you hear it? Did you hear it? Uh, yeah, so basically everything has to be voluntary. We can't force anyone to, to fix the problem. Um, and Seven Lakes is not a regulatory agency. We have no authority to to regulate things. And uh, we have a policy. We're not going to report people to the code enforcement officer because then people won't reach out to us um, for help. So we can't, Seven Lakes cannot um, really enforce ordinances at all. Um, if the town had ordinances, would that help you though in communicating and getting people to cooperate, or don't you think it would um, be? It, it might. We could be like, hey, that's illegal. We're not going to report you, but you should probably get that fixed. Might help. Um, might also make people defensive and angry. So it, it, I think, yeah, I mean, it might help, but again, we, we don't have the authority to um, tell people what to do, really. But there lies the challenge, because the biggest opportunity to make improvements is right there. And, you know, there's the challenge if, if they don't, if enforcements don't work or if ordinances don't work to help her get through and make those improvements for property owners, you got to figure out a way to. Well, yeah, you know, I, don't, I don't think we're expecting. Yeah, I, I get it. Seven Lakes Alliance to have a team that goes around and enforces ordinances. Right. But uh, a lot of times uh, it's neighbors uh, that so, notice something or are aware of something and call the code enforcement officer. At least that is on trees and docks and you know, that's all. Yeah. And, and they call uh, them too. Yeah. And then the code enforcement officer could refer that party to Seven Lakes to get the problem fixed in some cases. She's well, and what I'm saying is that let's have an ordinance that's uh, that that property is in violation of and that the town, uh, through the code enforcement officer or the planning board, uh, is in a position to enforce that ordinance. And uh, I mean, I, I, I think that's what we need, right? I mean, I'm in agreement with, agree with you, Chris, because I think the key is the, five, the 319 money is there. How do you get the other half paid for? And is a property owner going to just voluntarily come up with the money without an ordinance being in place? I mean, I face that now. And, and so the property owner wouldn't do it, so the Road Association had to pay for it. And I don't think that's right. I just have a question. How does your code enforcement officer enforce well, he just left the room, so I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, Hans, Hans was here. He just uh, stepped out. Um, when he comes back, we should redirect we, him. Yeah, we should ask him. Uh, it is one of the things that Auburn and Lynn was saying is to have, make sure your ordinances are really clear, really enforceable. Um, so here he is. Here he is. <laughs> we had a question for you, Hans. Uh, the question was uh, how, how, if, say, we had an ordinance that uh, pertain to um, a road, a road, a road, you know, uh, maybe it's new construction. It's clear in the existing ordinance. How do you enforce that? Uh, there already is in Julian Zone a road section. Okay, so they consider roads to be structures. So any new road has to meet the same criteria as a new structure. It has to be set back at least 100 feet. So I was back to thinking, just how do we expand on that? Because all they're doing is they created a setback for roads. There's not really a standard for it. Right. So now if you've got structure, even if it's a right of way, cutting through somebody else's property, and I guess all the users for that right of way, the better factor would have to be responsible for its maintenance. So it kind of sounds like there is a road section hanging down into it, but um Maintenance and required control installations. Yeah, I mean, so there are some standards in here. I haven't really studied this part of the uh, 
the ordinance, but seems like it's a, it's a jump in the place. Well, interestingly, um, kind of following up on that, uh, I believe it's Wyndham again that using that law, that main law, the main law allows a town to fix the problem, the erosion problem, and then build the road association for the for the cost. Um, and you know that's that's taking it fairly aggressively. So that's, that's the main law that allows main you. law allows you, but only a road association. So if it's a loose confederation of homeowners, right. there's no mechanism. Who do you who do you the road who do you build? Road association is a legal entity. It's a legal entity, and so it, it has advantages, but it has that specific disadvantage. Right. One might think um, that it could be charged with the the. How many towns do that, and have, has it ever been done, and has it been challenged? I don't know, but um, it, it's apparently passed legal review because it is a law. And and could you expand that beyond road associations? Why not own individual homeowners with bad driveway? Um, right. To take it to that, right? Yeah. yeah I, would, I would think to start, you have to have a road standard. You need a standard because. With bumpers and well, bumpers and also turnouts and everything. How the road is constructed with proper the rocks on it. Yeah, right. Just, just like a section. And uh, oh, it wasn't it. It's because of chill. Different people like different materials. They want crushed, crushed and run gravel versus that one. Sorry, I didn't want to do it. Didn't you ask how does he enforce? Yeah, that's yeah. the question. Yeah. So if you've got someone, road association or private property person, who's in violation. What can you do to that as the code enforcement office? That's what the violation is and how the ordinance reads. So you're looking for the ordinance to be written that says you're going to be fined fifty dollars a day until it's approved or some something yeah, like that. I, I can't just enforce stuff I made up. No, I know, but I guess the question so the question is sort of you know just big picture. Um somebody cuts a tree 20 feet from the lake um and their neighbor reports them. And you come in. How do you, how do you enforce? And the ord ordinance says you can't do that. How do you enforce that? What's the what's your mechanism? I guess that's your question. Yeah. Right? Say what's your mechanism to enforce that? I would write a notice of violation, and depending on how egregious it is, I'm allowed to find between a hundred dollars a day to five thousand dollars a day. So oh, you can also take it toward it. At a certain level as well, correct? Well, any notice of violation can end up in court if okay. they disagree and want to fight it. And yeah. That's why they yeah. let me per day until what happens? Supreme Court will decide. No, no, no. no. You say you're 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 fighting them so much per day, and then it per, per day, but there must be an end date. What happens? So they fix the road or the driveway. So they so until they fix it is that what you're saying only i would say this is the violation and as of this date usually 30 days out you get another twenty five hundred dollar fine for every 30 days so you know for each month of violation or until it's fixed until, until it's fixed. fixed okay yeah and in case of a tree cutting down that's just a fine and there's you know and probably have to replant trees to replace that would be a one time and they're replanting and there's a five-year maintenance period of New growth of tree that if it should die or a beaver bites it down, it has to be replaced. And so it's all in the letter. I see. Okay. Is but wasn't it the town of Wyndham or somewhere in Sebago Lake? Raymond. Raymond, where they had two hundred and fifty. The town was incurring two hundred fifty thousand dollars in legal fees fighting someone who cut down trees. Yeah. So yeah. they're trying to fix that problem, and in the enforcement and the fighting continue. And that's why in the letter there's always the legal clause at the end that you would be responsible for legal expenses incurred by the town. And and that that situation uh, provoked uh, LD 2101, yeah. which was passed recently. And one of the things on our sheet here is to figure out what does that mean. You know, uh, I'm not sure. When you can put a lien on their property. Okay, so that that was that came from that Raymond situation, and yep. so so that's one thing. Put a lien. What else? Can you do anything else? Well, that's one of the things with um, the city of Auburn too. Is that when you have to do a buffer, 
it's actually um, recorded at the registry. So it goes with your deed. So they follow that buffer indefinitely for that property for new construction. So there's things that you can do to make it enforceable uh, and on the record. So that's like an erosion buffer on a road or? or on a road, a house, yep. Any new development. development. And that's an Auburn. Yeah. Lake Tahoe new development in, in certain mm -hmm. zones, it has to be paved because uh, they don't think the gravel roads hold up to winter plowing and things right. like that. The other thing is what we're taking from the stand of BLA is education and making sure we hide like in the case of septics. That's gonna be our big push yeah. this year. We sent out one email blast slash Facebook post but then every month is Actually, the summer moves along. We'll have that. We've got an article coming out on our newsletter. And Richard LaBelle reached out uh, to uh, septic companies to see who would give a discount. So nice. if they say they, they're they part of the PLA, mm -hmm. uh, at, yeah, I think it's Stanley's, they get a 10% discount. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think education is a big part. And then you can come in once we've done a good job of educating, then the enforcement. Yep. And, then, and that's. A phased approach is so this is kind of what they're planning. I think in Auburn too is kind of a phased approach and preceded by a lot of outreach and education first to at least pe make people aware of the issue and why they're doing it, um, why it's important to do. Um, and I think I mentioned earlier that Lake Auburn has this filtration system exemption waiver um that you know they want to maintain otherwise the cost to the town or or city is going to be huge to put in these big you know tens of million dollar systems so um yeah one issue that concerns me first there i'm glad you brought up about education is that i keep thinking that the work we do today to try and revise the shoreland zoning ordinance has to be go to the electorate and how we really have to start now thinking about how we're going to market the shoreland zoning amendments that we're talking about and get it to the public and get them to be educated and in favor of it and so i think that the bla the seven la in their newsletters and i think that this committee could put an article in the town newsletter yeah i mean i think we really have to make it what's start problem? making an effort and and if you know where you're septic you know where the pump out is. Have you pumped it in the last three to five years? Right. You don't know where it is. Probably haven't pumped it in the last three to five years. <laughs> <laughs> but you also have people who believe it's not good to pump your septic because you're getting rid of the microbes and breaking down the sewage. But we got to educate them that that's Exactly. Pump. We got to tell them that you're saving your leaching field, which is $20,000 plus, right. by pumping it regularly. They have, they have to see the ROI. In and the I place. also found out on Facebook, I'm just kidding, <laughs> my neighbor. But you don't use Ridex, you actually use Baker's yeast in warm water. Doesn't it? Huh? It doesn't. Yeah. doesn't? Well, that's what you well, we do. So don't believe like anything. Well, they, they, they they broke come, so we can ask him because I'm going to ask him. We, we, we ask need to ask him because he, he had that in one of, his, one of the things he put out. He said, don't uh, add stuff. But uh, yeah. I, and so I, I, I've been buying this stuff, um, green pig or something that you drop in every three months and in the your septic system and it has the supposedly the correct bacteria it's but, like probiotic food. yeah exactly so uh, i guess so, well, that's that what we're going to that's a waste of time yeah the rex is supposed to be like a probiotic for your for your septic i mean i've also seen uh, red i think consumer reports said the same thing don't use that you've right? got plenty of bacteria in your septic there's, there's plenty yeah, there should be Unless your bacteria, unless yeah, unless you're unless you're putting stuff down your septic, like yeah. bleach, like lots bleach. of bleach, and lot yeah, and that, that you use far too much uh, detergent and other things in your wash, so that a lot of, of unused detergent winds up into the septic system. Right. Yeah. So don't. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just um, getting back to the uh, roads. Uh, what the carrot, one of the carrot hasn't been uh, really talked about, is offering to the uh, residents who are on the, on the road a incentive, incentive like have their property tax reduced on a per, per foot basis if you got 20 feet on the road, 
you 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 get ten percent you get ten percent off, all right? And, and it's based upon its number of feet on the road. So you to present that to the form of a board and to the people who bought the road, you're going to get some incentive there. So you know, rather than telling them, okay, we're going to find it. I mean, you can get that into the ordinance more. Go carry to the area. So that, uh, you know, oh, so, so you you're saying that um, if your road complies with best management practices, or what? Uh, how would you? Um, how would that property owner get the discount? With, well, not just because they have a road, but uh, what happened? What do they have to do to bring the car? I have an idea. Uh, yeah. I think it's the exact opposite of what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> what you do is your tax assessor goes and starts taxing everybody on the road structure, and you can alleviate the tax when the road is inspected and built to the proper standards. But we'd have to come up with a standard. Huh? One way so we'll look at it. We create the assessment and then you weigh the assessment. Is there any assessment now? Mm -hmm. No. This is just for roads within the shoreland zone. I, mean, I would say every dirt road there is. Sorry, Charles. <laughs> you know, if it's an unpaid road, the plows are going to push the dirt off into the ditch. But what's the, the standard ditch? for the road? What are you going to utilize? I know. There, there are standards. You could just plop in the DOT standards. Yeah. For the road. roads. There's, there's, a, there's a, there's a state, the DOT camp, um, camp road maintenance yeah. plan. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and, and that, and that's right? what the city of Auburn's doing. They're, they're referencing all these updated, you know, documents. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, eventually they get the tax credit for the tax credit. Yeah, that's a fine idea. One of the things we said in Rome was trying to get different road, road commissioners from all the road associations together to try to see what their best practices are and maybe to share equipment. Like we have a greater um, in Wildwood Estates because we have three miles of camp roads. <laughs> um, but you know, they could share equipment. How many times a year do we use the greater to right. at best? Um, so trying to get the road commissioners together for a meeting for all the roads around here to say, you know, what's working, where are you getting your sand? We have a sand and salt shed that we built, um, but what are other people doing would be good to know. Again, I like the carrot better than the stick. Like, how do you help them? I mean, 7LA and BLA have helped our area a lot. They're coming out again. I mean, they've done a lot on our roads. Yep, I think inst instituting a tax would then give you the money to hire people to do the assessments to then give people the carrot of, hey, you did it right. Hmm. Lots of ideas, isn't it? Yeah. No, that's, that's really right. good. That is a good idea, yeah. 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 Camp roads really are a problem. Yeah. Well, who do you tax? Yeah. Have we a butter on the road? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Who's already paying right. dues to the road commissioner to maintain the roads? Well, you know, it's it's complicated because some parts of the roads are not in the shoreland zone. So we're talking about the shoreland zone uh, ordinance. So, yeah. um, you know, we, on our road, half of it's in and half of it's out, you yeah. know, so, I mean, that, um, and then technically, whenever, whenever it crosses a stream of right. a large enough size, you're also within that area, 75 feet on each side within right. the shoreland zone. So, right. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. but that's, you know, sort of good from a planning point. And if you take care of those issues, that's what we want. That's when they have vernal pools and yeah. wetlands. Well, right. I mean, most camp really do have, have a lot of that area. too, which are, we, we know very little about our vernal pools, you know, um, on paper. So, most haven't been identified on paper for exactly those same privacy reasons you were talking about earlier. They don't want enforcement. Any more? Christian, I have anything? Um, Randy, what uh, you said last year's uh, 
Yeah. Uh, what well, what did you experience? Uh, I guess I can start with the history of our camp. Um, my grandparents, my grandmother was camping in the, the North End Freight Pond back in the late 1800s. Um, and there was a camp built, um, not our camp, but um, it was called Monk's Camp, right near Turner's Brook. Well, I know it as Turner's Brook. And then um, my great grandparents built a camp right smack the north end of uh, Great Pond in 1917. I think it was completed in 1920. And I was looking through some pictures recently because uh, we we really kept our place as sort of the ideal shoreland buffers, trees. Yeah. We control the tree growth and so forth. And we know our land intimately and the rocks and boulders intimately and have pictures of over the years. And in the last of uh, I guess probably 10 years, there's definitely been a change in the height of the water during the, I guess the winter spring time. And last year, I don't know what the lowest level of the water was, because I know the dam being worked on and so forth. Um, but it was the very worst, I would say, in 160 years of what's taken place. And the soil and the undercutting of the land is so was such a shock when I arrived. I, I knew um, that there had been high water, but I didn't understand that it was when the winds are from the south, mm -hmm. um, where we get the full brunt of it, um, just what was changed. And that leads me to the feeling that the shoreline zoning and all the, the roads and the phosphorus, that what happened this year is just, I, I, I can't even describe it. It was such, such a, uh, an abrupt change because of the height of the water and then the wave action must have gone up. We were on a, an embankment that we don't, it's not a beach, and there must have been waves coming up 10 feet and boulders and just, Soil is washed you, away. You have a, a grandfathered dock that we has have two grass grandfathers. on it, right? I mean, are, are well, well, that one, that was long. Is that gone? That, that's, yeah, well, that never. So, was this the December storm or was it the spring of last year's storm? And this is probably December, all through the winter. Um, yeah, December 18th, that was yeah, very bad. Top, I don't know for sure because no one saw it. She had to be there to see it. Yeah. Um, but we can see the ramifications of it where there was a, a clearing out. You can sort of see where the normal stuff from our trees comes down and the stuff was wiped away. And we had two grandfathered in um, docks with rock foundations and things that have never been mm -hmm. disturbed since 1920. Um, have been disturbed, and then the shoreline itself has been altered. And you can see big, big boulders having been undercut. And um, I think it was probably a lot of ice uh, uh, because um, Uncle Phil's dock, you know, the um, um, Bonnie, you, yeah. know, the, you know, that dock there, that's been pushed off of its foundations. I've never seen that happen. The, that boathouse. Got pushed in on the uh, on the south side, so there must have been uh, a, a whole bunch of ice that uh, went uh, it was driven by a south wind that would have impacted your shoreline. Then she's right next to you. Yeah, first of all, we had the December eighteenth storm. Yeah, and then that like six inches of storm, rain. and then yeah. that left the ice to. I mean, I was here for the storm. It was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people near me had yeah. docks up way up on the yeah. land and they washed out to the lake. Right. I yeah. lost. Um, I just found one of my neighbors got uh, in the middle of the I, I lost so many trees that I can't even tell you. Yeah, that's what Yeah, I had a dock in the store and part of my dock. 
So that yeah, erosion yeah. everywhere. Yeah. 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 I've had concerns and I was looking through pictures um yesterday of um in fact <clears throat> I don't know exactly when it changed, but CMPs control the the level of the lake. And back in the 40s, maybe early 50s, um the water was drained in the fall, late fall probably 15 feet offshore. So it's like, oh, okay, because the, the rock foundations that we have were left untouched. And then over the years that changed. And, um, and I guess the concern is what is taking place with the management of the water levels in the fall? Yeah, I think what happened this year, from what I think I've been reading about, it, we got so much water that they couldn't just let down Great Pond because it was then flooding Long Pond. But how low was Great Pond? Uh, it, it, it was never, it never got low because it just kept being so much water. I mean, there was a, a six inch storm, yeah. uh, and that's six inches, you know, in one spot, and you've got a watershed draining that in. So, I mean, maybe Lynn or Charlie can tell you six inch rainstorm. How much does that? Uh, I think it was up to 13 inches above dam level at the Great Pond for a long time. Yeah, it was high and we got 10 inches in um, December, 10 inches in March, and, and and then it takes what you're saying at least a couple of weeks to work through that system because it's coming from right. East Pond to North Pond to. You know, and, kind of back and then you know, Florida Power and Light is controlling the. It uh, was wide open. The the yeah. dams were wide open. That in was Oakland, they were wide open in Wings Mill. Um, okay. they, Wings they, Mill they, didn't open it up really enough. That's why yeah, I was told. And uh, when I started asking, which was in January, you know, so it may have been delayed. Um, I was told they were wide open in January, the, the Wings Mill, but they didn't open Great Pond all the way because they were afraid they couldn't. The Long Pond was way over. It was, Long Pond was already overfilled. Because um, Castle Island that, flooded. Castle Island was flooded. We only yeah. lose two inches a, a day when everything's open. So that's how much de so, declines. So we were in trouble in Long Pond. They could let the water the railroad, but how low was Great Pond taken? I saw rocks I've never seen before because they were bring comparing the dams. It was the lowest I've ever seen it. Like I was really impressed with how low it was in the fall. And then you get 10 inches and you get all the rain coming from everywhere coming in. And then you had another storm. It was the highest I've ever seen it, but it's not an uncontrollable situation because of nature. Yeah, and um, yeah, climate change rains here. Great Pond absorbs a, a, a lot more water. Said whereas Long Pond, for every inch of rain, it raises three inches. So Long Pond is very sensitive to the, the runoff. Yeah, and that's why we have to wait for Long Pond to get to a manageable level before we open the gates at Great Great Pond. And they were, they went from the dam construction. They were thirty inches low mm -hmm. to. They barely finished the construction before yeah. all the storms were accumulating yeah. quickly. But and then the dam was open without yeah. the they left the sandbags, the copper dam is still in there because it got covered up before they could pull it out. Hmm. So that can be removed at a later date. But it's been one of those things where they've been trying to flush the water and the dam in the village is built and I want to open right after that. Right. Just storm after storm after rainfall and the dam was open trying to lower the great pine. It just kept coming along. And because of that, the ice was ridiculous. There was a ice difference of like a foot in Long Pond because the dam was open and the channel going through. Yep. It was bad ice. Yeah, terrible. So, yeah. yeah. And it was, yeah. So getting back to you know, the point down in an open. Who controlled that dam? Where that's Florida Power and Light. Yeah, so you know, what's the communication between Florida and Light? <laughs> they're, and Light? they're trying to maximize revenues like every good company. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. They did open that dam on request, but we tried to get okay. the lower the Belgrade stream to lower faster because the drop rate obviously from Great Pond to Long Pond, you've got about a five foot difference. But from the Wings Mill to Oakland running through the Meselonsky, there's very little drop. So getting them to drop Meselonsky a few inches 
does take a little bit of back pressure off, allows a little bit more water to flow, but going through the long mess velocity stream, there's your erosion control. You've got a lot of structures that are slowing water down, all the vegetation, all the turns. So you don't get a rapid flow through mess velocity. And, and the old yeah. they told me they knew they were going to flood some of the houses on Messalonsky stream and pass the dam. And but they said they had to do it. But yeah, they've got all that wind bell in there slowing things down. Does it slow things down? Oh well, I don't think so. I I'm assuming that I don't know for sure. There's a yeah. whole lot of it. Yeah, there's a lot of it. All the milk water. It's all I think you should speak for the dam committee. We just, this committee doesn't have yeah, it. Yeah, we have nothing to do. We have nothing to do with yeah, that. I, I think, Randy, our, our concern is more the water quality. And and uh, um, yes, that's these events, uh, which we're probably going to see more of because of climate change, uh, are extreme and they have impact on on the shoreline and everything. But the phosphorus in the lake, uh, the phosphorus that's in the sediment, um, the phosphorus that's coming in from uh, the external load. Um, our concern is, and, and I speak about Great Pond because that's where I live, but um, you know, we've seen uh, East Pond and North Pond have algae blooms and, uh, and uh, Great Pond. And I, I, you know, I see Pete Callens uh, every two weeks his water quality uh, um, report and I'm the water quality manager for Great Pond. And, and um, his secchi discs are no better than ours and probably worse. You know? So I don't think Long Pond's a whole lot better. Uh, and so we're both, we're impaired and Long Pond's impaired and, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so, and Mesolonsky impaired as well? Threatened. Just threatened. threatened. Yeah, well, pardon my saying so, but the, uh, these categories, which are DEP categories are, don't make much sense. Um, uh, uh, salmon, which had the worst water quality of in, in all of Belgrades uh, late last August, it was down to a second disc of 1.7, uh, is listed as threatened uh, versus impaired for long pond, which um, doesn't make much sense to me. Yeah, we're worried like you know, great ponds at five and a half meters or something. Yeah, no, I mean, that was a relatively brief period. We had this massive bloom that lasted for about two and a half to three weeks, and then it died off, and, and the lake was actually relatively clear from that point all the way right through. Um, but it's but it, it does tend to bloom every fall, and so, but it's let, only only listed as threatened versus other lakes that are clearly in better shape that are listed as impaired. So in any case, all of the lakes, all seven of the lakes, well, yeah, five of the seven lakes, I, I would actually take uh, McGraw Pond and Long Pond out of that list myself, but in any case, the lakes, most of our lakes are, you know, have serious water quality issues and we have to be really careful with them. It does give you a hook for implementing ordinances. Yes. It's because they're threatened and impaired and, you know, designated by DEP, it, it definitely gives you legal standing to... Yeah, yeah sure. And our, our thought is that uh, that um, algae blooms will um, really hurt the recreational ability of people uh, coming to these lakes and, and property values. Eventually, hit the property values, which will then affect the tax base of sure. uh, Belgrade. So that's um, right. before yeah. the East Pond treatment. Um, oh. People said that the property values had kind of leveled off for a decade, from like 2005 to. 2015 or so uh, on East Pond, and right. you know, realtors wouldn't bring people to show them in the middle of an algae bloom. So you lose a month of sales right there. Sure. Um, okay. You know, and so, but after that, the property values have gone up again after the Allen treatment. So, yeah. yeah. Look, I guess it looks, I mean, that's a, that was a great sales so bar, so good. You so know, far, six so years far. later. So, no. yeah. Yeah. Well, six years ago, they did that? 18. 18. Yep. Yeah. 2018. Yeah. 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 So, but, but Randy, the just the point that several people made, you really need to be talking to the to the dams committee. There's the what's called the interlocal dams committee, and they meet uh, they meet here nothing. monthly. Yeah, I've heard nothing. I've written. I've written yeah. nothing. Can you can you stabilize what you have so it doesn't oh, get any worse? Yes, I've talked to Lynn um, and the conservation for 
at some point when they are available can do that and um, and we'll take care of our doctors. I mean, this really was a hundred year storm. I mean, they had them in January on the coast. I mean, I've been here all my life and I have never seen a storm like that. Well, I would imagine it would have been quite something to see. It was unbelievable. It was like the ocean. Yeah. Right. The cleanup of branches and such were just incredible. We were really going on. Our place, we had very little. Well, wow. uh, we don't have any pine trees. It's mainly yeah. oak trees. So we got white pines and yeah, we were so a mess. So we had little stuff blown blown long distance. We know there was something pine. We had, we had well, to bring in the chair of the day. I was alone to give you his contact information. Okay. And they have yeah, five that. years. To I think that's you know, just to back you up. I think paying attention to shoreline erosion because of water levels, you know, which are related to dams and storms, um, mm -hmm. is something that we should pay attention to oh, as a community uh, because it is making an impact. Yeah. Um, and you know, what, that may mean some modifications to dams to open them up more in the winter if we're going to get these bigger storms. I'm, I'm not sure what the solution is, but paying attention to it's yeah. it's worth I'm thinking definitely. about. And probably the more feedback the dams committee uh, gets on this is I'm I'm, I'm sure they've uh, had a lot, but uh, you know oh they've got all kinds of feedback. <laughs> people have said don't leave the dams open because yeah. ice fishing got disturbed to the other end. So I've seen both yeah comments. <laughs> but the ice didn't form that early this year, so maybe no. that have helped your erosion. They hadn't been ten foot waves coming on you. Right. I'm right. sure they were ten foot. They were probably they were pretty nice. Yeah, yeah, you want to touch on this document that you sent out and discussion topics and ideas for changes? Is that yeah. part of your agenda today? This is kind of what we go through about the running. It's a running, yeah. It's I maintain this uh, land and, and it's a uh, just a, a running scratch pad of, of um of the issues for each of these topics, and we're happy to add or subtract to it. Um, for this uh, edition, um, down at the bottom of the septic systems, I put alternative adopt the draft ordinance for Keyser Lake at the bottom of this document. So then, um, then I just appended to it uh, outline for Keyser Lake uh, draft septic ordinance, uh, which has uh, you know an outline of the ordinance and then um, the uh, reports for. Uh, Evaluation and, and inspection for septic systems. So, you know that that's something that we're looking at. And uh, so, what's your what's the for this committee? What's the time frame? When what what, <laughs> what are we talking? Are we talking Glacial. months? Or are we talking about three weeks? We're gonna have a plan. Here we go. Well, um, <laughs> we're, we're trying to fact find and try to get our minds around this because there's a lot going on here. Yep. Um, then, if we could. Get to a point where we can agree on changes like outline form changes then i believe it goes to well i, I know that um there would be a town attorney planning board yeah, the, plan, uh, plan, so. the select board yep. the uh, dp and uh the voters yep. so it's going to take uh, a very long time to actually implement uh, a change so how long well, we we gotta, we gotta what's your goal? Is six months? A well, year? Yeah, year? think backwards. We're trying to get it before the March meeting next year. Okay, so there you go. So, so, so you think yeah, I, I, uh, that's I, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. If we could do it, if we think, but I mean, we haven't really discussed what would be the ideal, you know, yeah. so um, the, meeting. The best, or, the best case. Following that probably means the warrant, you know, need to be on the warrant by January, right? Yeah, so you, you can't do it in, in the an election like the fall uh election. I mean, is that so well, uh, it's possible, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, twice a month to speed it up, but still, yeah. it's so much as you can so, see today, you, lots of ideas come out, right? Yeah, which is a certain point, you got to kind of, yeah, 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 we're still gathering, it yeah, so okay, gathering and we're debating as well. Do we want to make it, um you know, something very palatable that might not be move the needle as far as water quality yep. goes, or do we want to shoot for something more aggressive? And then what are the implications on, uh, you know, getting it passed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and that's the, 
I think um, the the Peter Lake uh, uh, ordinance. Uh, uh, actually, I think I cut out the part where it talked about the uh, the basically the shoreland property owners are not the voters. It, I cut it out. It, it was originally came over, and that so the voters we really need to get this passed are not typically the ones that are going to be directly affected for the most part, you know, which is an advantage to us getting a more aggressive, uh, you know, because a lot of property owners are not going to necessarily like uh, having to look at their septic system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I know of systems that are completely failed and uh, haven't, you know, were never designed, you know, they were designed uh, probably 80, 100 years ago, and uh, never been. Um, and I, I actually won this now, just been upgraded. Okay. So maybe if we're targeting that March deadline, that's maybe over positive, but that's the way I like to be. Back off when you got to have it ready to go, come up with a timeline. In the meantime, for like the next six months, while you're gathering information, be educating the public. Right. Mm -hmm. Through articles, BLA is going to continue to do that. I'm sure Running Air Lake Association is going to do it. Right? We haven't yet, but that's a good idea. Yes. So, and maybe we can coordinate. Should sure. we write a good article? We'll give it to you. Fair enough. How's that sound? Sounds great. Okay. And then we put stuff in the town newsletter, too. That can come from this committee. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a couple um, audiences. One would be like a, a BLA annual meeting yep. audience, you know, that sort of audience. Yep. Or Sam and McGraw or any yes, of so that. Yeah, too. But yeah. that, ordinance, that audience is not typically going to vote on the uh, ordinance because they're, they're mostly, my my guess would be they're mostly. A good portion are not permanent residents. Are or are not. not. Are not, are yes. Not. That's what I would uh, say. So then there's another audience, which would be the town of Belgrade voters and um, how do we get them to care mm -hmm. about this and then you yeah, know educational articles not from the BLA because BLA is going to go with art right, right. might be more right. language, but the town newsletter the town I'm website also thinking that you know maybe, maybe there's some or grassroots or... maybe there's some real grassroots getting volunteers to go uh, and contact people and really get out rather than yeah. sort of passive advertising door to door yeah um, uh, your campaign yeah. yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think so. so. I mean, yeah. we last fall or one fall, we had a night meeting, didn't we? And that was a good time to, meet, to get more. The uh, Center for All Seasons, we had a big meeting. At Center for All Seasons, we had a good meeting. It was a good one. Yeah. That was a good one. And we should try and have one or two meetings like that and when we can get more citizens involved. I mean, I mentioned to you having these meetings at 3 30 in the afternoon. You're not going to get working class people right. here, and we right. need to make it more easily yeah. available to them. No, the, the town meeting uh, last week was at seven o'clock at night, I think. Yeah. And uh, a, a, a gentleman next to us was saying, I, I just got off work, I had a hard time getting to this town meeting at seven o'clock at night. Yeah, <laughs> so you know, it all depends. But I think if, if there's a, a not a it can be focused, but still a little bit of a, you know different yeah. ways to attack. And you've got an idea, you said. Yeah, like like again, back to the care thing. You can penalize people, but how about articles that praise and showcase the people that did do something? Right. Here's a here's an example of a great property yes. for these people. Just yeah. keep praising them. And they cost a lot thing. because they took the initiative early. Yes, this is the work that's been done that's positively impacting. Mm -hmm. So using that town newsletter, how often does that come out? Once a quarter. Once a quarter. Once a quarter. It's just there's a there's, just, there's one that's in press right now. Yeah, that's in press right now. It depends yeah. on the start right. <laughs> yeah. Put a note. Checks the town newsletter. Hmm? Who gets the town newsletter? Uh, all anybody who pays taxes. All, all anybody who pays taxes in Belgrade. Whether they're here or not. Yeah. So so Lynn uh, at uh, at the um, uh, at the Seven Lakes Alliance building. Uh, what if we have. Uh, the Secchi disc score uh, for each pond uh, posted on the side of the building. Um, yeah, just like a thermometer or something. Yeah, like well, yeah, yeah, just like basically, yeah, so we can have a competition. Right. You know, right. Great pond winning uh, over one point. I mean, it's just, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. just to get the, the, get the water quality the out there. Like, I realized that uh, the long pond's probably 
sign to do that. Okay. Yeah. Good we, thought. Good thought. Do... Hey, Chris, getting back to this document yes, just for a second. Right. In reviewing it, a lot of good thoughts and good information in there. Uh, and looking at the septic se section, which is the first one, it looks like the assumption is everyone has a septic system because all these bullet points are something to do with a current septic system, whether it's you know uh, up to standard or needs improvement or so forth. I had to have a neighbor who doesn't have any septic system. Has a holding tank. Has a holding yeah, tank. Yeah, you and I have talked about yeah, that. Yeah. So, I mean, I would think you, an ordinance could be you've got to have a, you know, a, a septic system to start with. Yeah. Um, to add that thought. I And I'm absolutely. absolutely. I mean, the holding tank and then what? Pump they pump it out. If they don't pump it out, it overflows. It's about 20 feet from the lakeshore, too. Mm -hmm. It does over here the wall to the lakeshore. It does overflow. Oh, yeah. Well, they use it a lot. And then I get uh, I get algae like crazy in front of our camp in front of the oh. matter of fact, this blooms. You know, yeah. fortunately they're not there very much. You know, but right. nevertheless, there's probably other camps like that in the lakes too. That yeah, Abs no, absolutely. And and we we read uh, actually Lenny sent around a chapter of a book that uh, uh, had a um, excerpt or uh, talked about a Minnesota study where. Um, where a leaking septic system they thought, and it wasn't maybe the worst, but it was a bad one, would release four pounds of phosphorus in the lake uh, each year. And a pound of phosphorus produces in general, 500 pounds of algae. So yeah. four pounds, two tons, 2000 yeah. pounds of algae in the lake from one system. So our neighbors are there are frequently, but their kids were there for three weeks, two years ago. And after they were there three weeks, the, the metaphyton from their camp down for the next six camps was just a green field. And it's just, you could just see that the fact that it had been used overflow, except, you know, the plus the nutrients were flowing in the lake and the algae responded big, big time. So, 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 and we can't wait for that camp to be sold because it's now that right. they, their children are using it, right? That's so right. it may never actually right. be yeah. sold. Right. We can't wait for that. So, I mean, so, your yeah, should be, you know, you've got to have a substance. Well, I think that's, if you look at the end of this document, uh, the uh, outline for the Keyser Lake draft septic ordinance, uh, it talks about um, the three site levels. Uh, site level one, older systems are targeted for inspection first, and they're required to be done within two years. These are the ones that don't have designs on record or were installed before site evaluation was adopted in July of 1974. So, um, in that situation, you know, that camp would come up for an inspection and the inspector would say, you don't have a septic system. Right. You yeah. need to comply with it. Yeah, we need to somehow right. turn that into, I mean, do you know, plumbing inspector has an opinion. What's that? Plumbing inspector has an opinion on it. Right. A prime right. plumbing tank right. holding tank, yes. holding tank is better than a septic system. Now the, sept the holding tanks are supposed to have Level alarms and systems that need to be inspected. Those cement culverts in the ground vertically with no top. It just says it. Well, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a holding tank. That's, that's, a, that's a, probably that's a cesspool. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. What town is that? Rome. 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 That's a cesspool. It's Rome. Yeah. Okay. So, but it's not always just it's ones on lake. Long. It's ones on streams right. that then feed downstream. Sure. We're doing an inspection in our area. And Andy Marble dropped dye in our neighbor's tank that we thought was a problem, and we could not get dye out. So it's coming somewhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's we're having a figure it out. A terrible time trying to figure out. Yeah. Everyone's got their septic pumped. We're like playing Russian roulette. We're trying to figure out where it's coming from, and I think it's coming from up the hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hans, I think that's a good point. A a functioning holding tank is better than a septic system. Yeah. 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 You could. You yeah. could. Like you could have um, yeah, it's functioning well. Yeah, what, what was that like? Uh technically that overflowing holding tank that pumped a bunch of waste into the lake would be considered could be considered a discharge of pollution into the lake, which is against state law. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's that is something that they could get heavily fined for because that is against a state law and i i put in the chat the title uh it's title 38 section 413 so one thing that would be easy don't have to change any ordinances is to have people report 
malfunctioning holding systems or right. holding tanks because right. that's a very obvious sign of pollution. Yeah, and, and I think that we rely on our neighbors to to ride on your other. Well, so that's the other question I have is that's I mean a septic system is pricey. And a lot of these older homes that are in family, they just don't have the money. Is Seven LA doing anything to work with the state to try to get grants, low interest loans to these people? Because I, we're going to find a lot of them are just down and out, and they might want to do the best thing, but they can't. So there is a uh, community, I, I get the full name of it, but there's a community grant program. Um, for septic systems it has to come from the town. So the town has to apply for it. For a period, most of a decade, it wasn't funded by the legislature, but it's been funded again the last several years. So there's money in it. Um, town has to apply and, and the people who own the property have to meet income guidelines. So they can't earn a lot of money. Well, that's right. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to say is yeah. thank you for inviting Michelle and I to yeah. join you today. Thank you. you know, we're glad to have you. We're in the Rome Committee. We're partners in the same one. Yeah. 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 Sister committee. And you know, our right. thought was that everything yeah. that happens here, we should know about and everything we yeah. do, you should know about so that we collaborate and, and work you know, very cooperatively. And in the end, when we come up with ordinances, we need to be the same ordinance, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. They need no, to be absolutely. as closely linked as possible so that we're enforcing one set of common ordinances across all the lakes. Right. So, and, and we'd love to have representatives yeah. from your committee join us. When does your committee meet? Next one is June 20th, which is a Thursday at four o'clock. Uh, we also want to try to get, see, see if we can get some folks from uh, Oakland to come as well. Mount Vernon. And Mount Vernon and possibly Sydney, though that may be a What is the name of the lift? I'm sorry. What is the name of the committee? It's the, it's the uh, Water Quality and Natural Resources Committee. I think same. We copy your names. You were already coordinating and collaborating. Yeah. Lynn, I'll be here. Good. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. June 20th. Yeah. 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 Great. No, I think this is great. Well, I think, yeah, it's a very uh, good, robust uh, meeting today. Thanks uh, to everybody. Thanks, uh, Charlie and Lynn, for. Uh, for interrupting a whole bunch. Uh, what is the, uh, just one of the, uh, the pounds of phosphorus per acre in that document that you circulated? I just couldn't follow that. You know, the testing that they did on uh, on what, Route 27 or... or um, uh, is this on the road? Yeah, on the road, uh, runoff, uh, you know, they were trying to quantify the runoff on specific roads. Right. Um, it was in pounds per square, uh, pounds per acre, and I just, I don't know, it was acre of what? An acre of road, acre of ditch? I actually, I'm going to take a look at it and yeah. talk to you. I'm, I'm guessing the road itself, the structure, but... Mm. Yeah. Do you recall then? The, no. No, so I, I just... I, I have to look. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Couldn't figure that out. I mean, all of our modeling has to do with pounds per acre, you know, okay. so depending on the land use, whether it's roads, whether it's development, whether it's forest. So it's all so, but I'm so I'm guessing if it was the road study, it would be that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Anything more? Would you like me to invite the fellow from uh, Auburn? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. Right. Yeah. I think, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. I think we're trying to get Dave Rope to come to the next meeting, which is uh, yeah. the 11th. That's it. The 11th. So, uh, okay. it will be another time other than that. Yeah, when we'll is the next it. meeting after that? Um, June, June, correct? 25th would be, the, would be the next one after that. 27? Uh, 25. Well, uh, 11 would be 14. Yeah, is it the, 25. Yeah. Is it the second and fourth meeting? The second and fourth. Okay. Yeah, so well, I'll um, send the genders out to everybody who's here today. So we'll see. You. So I'll find out if you can make the, uh, the that second one yeah. in June. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Is it always at three thirty? Three thirty. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Right here, second. second. Yes. All those in favor.
Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Hawks. I haven't seen you taking notes since you've been having Saturday. Yeah, that would be great. We'd love to have you. Uh, I'm going to say uh, probably yeah, I don't know. 65 members, and it's probably 25 to 35 that are fairly happy. Okay. We got our launch party last week.